All right. Um, so thank you all for coming to day one of our Movement Lawyering two-day series. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be able to introduce our two panelists for today. Uh, first, we have Afsana Rigo, who is a legal researcher and human rights advocate working on uh, issues of technology, LGBTQ rights, refugee, and human rights. Uh, she's currently working with the Middle Eastern North Africa program at Article 19, and she's also a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. Her recent work looks at the intersections of technology and human rights with a focus on marginalized groups, especially uh, MENA LGBTQ communities. She also has extensive work bringing in this research to place pressure on corporate responsibility for their implication in human rights violations. And Afsana is going to begin with a short presentation on the basics of movement lawyering, uh, with a focus again on the MENA context. And then we will, and then uh, Afsana will be interviewing uh, our second panelist, Yumna Makhlouf. Uh, Yumna is a PhD candidate in law at the, and I apologize for this, I, my French is terrible, Université Paris, Il Pantheon Assas. Uh, her dissertation examines the question of the identity of the individual in Lebanese private law. She's a teacher and researcher at the Faculty of Law in St. Joseph University of Beirut. Yumna is also an attorney of the Beirut Bar Association and provides legal support as part of Legal Agenda Lebanon. Her publications and research focus on gender, identity, nationality, family, personal status, and religious law. Um, so just a uh, quick uh, kind of ground rules. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be recorded. Um, also, you'll see at the bottom, uh, there are both a Q&A function and a chat function. So we're asking that if you have questions for the panelists, you put those in the Q&A. That allows us to see the questions in order. And you can also go in there and view other people's questions and upvote them. So if you have a question, see if someone else has already asked it. And if so, you can bump that to the top. Um, if for anything else, so if you wish to share resources, if you wish to make a comment, if you wish to uh, give us a compliment or register a complaint, uh, please use the chat functionality. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Afsana for the introduction to movement lawyering. Uh, just give me a second while I try and get this up on here, but I'm so happy to be doing this and I'm very grateful to our sponsors and Mason and Kendra who work to make this happen at um, Harvard and we're hoping to make sure that this continues to happen um, and that we continue to have more movement lowering discussions. So I'll be giving a small um, introduction and then I'll jump into this conversation with uh, Yumna. Um, I will initially start by um, saying that the introduction I'm giving is my personal takeaways and understandings and um, feelings about movement lawyering and its importance. Um, what I would say that there is a very rich and long history of um, scholarship around movement lawyering and its implementation and I hope um, folks will go and look into that more after this discussion. Um, first, I want to start with one of the definitions that I really enjoy most, um, and it comes from Law for Black Lives, a organization that uh, works in the US um, advocating for um, uh, um, black citizens and non-citizens in the US uh, employing movement lawyering, and their definition of it is movement lawyering is to take direction um, directly from impacted communities and from organizers as opposed to imposing our leadership or expertise as legal advocates. It means building the power of the people and not the power of the law. And that's really fundamental in the baseline of what we mean by movement lawyering. So in this um, discussion around movement lawyering or community focus, it requires some of paradigms uh, and it requires us to and working with affected communities especially marginalized communities um, we need to center their needs first and um, uh, have a community centered approach to it so we're taking direct action um, from them based on needs and not pivoting or moving directly to asserting our own legal expertise and that is core it it means that 
you do not employ this sort of methodology when you're doing this work. You can harm the movements or inv individuals you're working with. Uh, and it will become more and more clear as soon as we have these um, discussions and the session tomorrow as well with and Danielle Blunt, which is going to be very exciting. Expanding more on the whys, um, most laws and regulations that we're talking about have not been and will not be created to protect the most marginalized. They are often used to protect the systems that create them. Um, and in the uh, sector I often look at within the online sphere, this is especially true. So if you're not employing elements and the methodologies of movement lowering, you can be feeding into the same sort of systems of oppression that have harmed communities and uphold, uphold their, the same systems that have been creating these sort of impacts on um, We need to also remember that the client and lawyer relationship in itself is rife with power dynamics and often the um, long-term goals we may have as uh, legal experts or uh, attorneys may have as representatives uh, aligned with the communities or the client itself and understanding that sort of personality we ourselves becomes very important because it can have an um and uh, moving on finally i want to also experts in the room. You will be um, working with experts who are directly impacted in living and um, experiencing um, what is needed and what is wanted. So therefore you are working with experts who have broad range of expertise way beyond their own experiences too and learning from them and bringing in and centering their lived experiences increases the chances of success in, ta in tackling bigger and complex cases. You'll also be able to understand the benefits or harm you can bring. I really enjoyed this segment in um, the uh, article by Alexi Nun Freeman and Jim Freeman that kind of emphasizes this point talking about how paralyzing it could be to try and tackle some of these um, massive issues that can impact low income communities of color or communities of color and other oppressed groups. Um, they say for many lawyers encountering those challenges can be profoundly discouraging and even paralyzing because our training does not provide us with the analytical tools um, or the practical skill sets needed to even envisage a viable path forward. Unlike conventional legal practice, there are no limits to what can be accomplished when movement lawyers embrace multifaceted grassroots power building. And um, I, I really encourage anyone to go and read this too. It's an inter interesting article. And the point about a multifaceted approach is really important because often I think um, folks coming uh, as attorneys of legal backgrounds may see their place as legal experts as being um, facet around suits and litigation, but legal experts can have a need to employ different methodologies and tool sets that are multifaceted to build around the needs of the communities they're working with. Um, I sometimes call this litigation saviorism. I have no idea if it gets used elsewhere, but I like it. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is often when, especially in West-centric conce um, conceptions of litigation and advocacy, um, the initial jump is to go and litigate about an issue. Um, this could be harmful for um, the movement that you're working with, because sometimes the litigation might not be the best answer, but also it needs to um, be accepted that legal expertise can be impactful in methods far beyond litigation itself. Um, training as legal practitioners in the US and in um, countries in the global north itself, even though I hate that term, um, really revolves around suits and legal actions often. It might fit what you may think is your purpose, 
but it could cause complications for the communities you're working with. Some of them can include drain on resources, financial costs, even further marginalization, and in cases, in a harmful precedent. Mm -hmm. um, oh. um, why do we need to move away from some of these West-centric models I'm mentioning about? Um, for example, when we're talking about the United States, it's very individualistic and it usually autonomizes disputes. Um, like I mentioned here, a methodology that really works against the organizing model. The system is designed to address disputes between a single plaintiff and often works against achieving collective goals and makes it very, the procedural rules make it very incredibly difficult to bring in these collective goals. So employing um, these sort of methodologies to ensure that we're not feeding into these same power dynamics and the power of the collective can be brought in requires understanding the multifaceted approaches to take um, when employing movement lawyering and working with communities and movements. I had some practical tips I want to put here. Yumna will be providing even better context and understanding here, but I, I, I had put some in here for us to just look at before we start the conversation. One, first realize that your clients are your partners, and that means in leadership, in control, and in decision making of whatever you're working towards. And you, you need to also ensure that whatever you're doing as part of a movement or support for a community, you're breaking it down to uh, as they will be breaking down what's going on within the community. You need to understand the strategies you will be using to help the groups. Again, like I mentioned, not defaulting to what you think they need and what your expertise is, but rather what could be helpful as a strategy building as part of a movement. Um, and this point, I think, is obviously relevant for anything. Always take part in self-reflection. How much of your work perpetuates racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, or elitism? And how often are you working to dismantle that within your own work? And um, are you and the community you're representing talking different languages of strategy, which often may happen? And you need to work to understand and um, understand each other's languages of strategy and adopt to that to make it even more powerful. Um, I would also really want to point as a call for action that whoever is working as part of their methodology as a movement lawyer, it becomes imperative that you try and um, kind of bring in more movement lawyers and encourage your co colleagues to employ movement lawyering to deconstruct what they see as um, their implementation of the law and their support because it requires a bigger movement than just a few. Um, something that we'll be talking about with Yimna too, uh, I know is that the legal jargon is a tool of power. Uh, the inaccessibility of this language is constructed within itself. And even when we're talking about work in NGOs or international organizations, I, I have colleagues that always tell me about the lawyers who have um, their own internal language that often becomes inaccessible to even their own colleagues and the community. And for this, as part of movement lawyering, breaking down this tool of power, this language of power becomes really fundamental. And your job will be in part working to make this language accessible in your partnership. Again, build your knowledge of the community and the movement you're trying to take part in and support and work to center what it means and stands for. Finally, I think you should really understand the strengths you bring um, as legal practitioners, experts and technical experts, especially lawyers, you're engaging with systems of power daily and you can bring support to these communities uh, from a different angle as like I can say here from like within the system itself, if you will. You speak the language of power and you can provide that access. And it's really important to um, highlight that, especially if you're a Harvard lawyer, provide that form, provide that access and provide that sort of different leveraging um, to balance these um, dynamics and power dynamics that may really harm these um, shifts and, um, and barriers that are looking to uh, um, block change. 
Um, I think we can really establish that it's important that um, you continue to talk about the systems of power and the expression of power within the community and bring that in. I'm going to from this uh, notion of talking about the language of power to um, the conversation with Yumna right now. a real message for many of the legal experts and technical employers, but the impact that it can bring can come really fundamental for movements and changes that occur. And that's something that I really want us to talk about, that although it takes more work than you may have been trained with and tools that you may have been provided with, is still work you do more fruitful. So now I'm just going to switch to um, our conversation with our wonderful colleague Yumna and we can like have a little um, back and forth about our own personal experiences and ideas and the incredible work she's been doing in Lebanon. Hi Yumna. Hi Hassan, how are you? I'm good. I, I thought initially if you wanted to provide any sort of um, a reflection on some of the points I made and then I can jump into uh, the questions. Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, having me here. I'm very happy uh, uh, to join in to this uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, I have seen in uh, your presentation a lot of points uh, that I, I identify with uh, um, that I can see in my daily uh, legal practice because um, we will see this uh, during our discussion but uh, the law at, is at the same time and the legal system is at the same time uh, a, a tool of power actually and a way to uh, um, a way to liberate uh, ourselves from the powers and to uh, um, destroy or at least uh, to reconsider uh, power dynamics within the society. And this is what we are going to discuss today. And uh, this, you can see it with the legal practice because, um, and it's, it's far away from everything theoretical that you can be taught, uh, because there are lots of power dynamics that will happen in the court, that will happen within the police, between the police force and between the individuals and between uh, different communities that that you are not going to learn at the university but that you are going to go into when you start actually practicing law and uh, as you were saying it is very uh, um, important to understand our role and to figure out what kind of lawyers we want to be because uh, since we are uh, really at the frontiers of the system of power and the communities and the individuals, our role uh, may vary very quickly and you can very quickly become an instrument of, of power without even knowing it. Um, or you can uh, also, uh, uh, and this is what we are going to discuss, or you can also try to recuperate this space uh, in favor of uh, certain communities in order to make their voices heard in the legal sphere. Uh, so this is what I had to say about your presentation, but there are lots, uh, a lot of other things that we will discuss, I think, with, uh, in the course of our discussion. Thank you, that's, uh, that's incredible. I really would love to um, give a bit of background on the work you've been doing, and also how you employing movement learning in Work and you already talked about it, but a little bit more what it means to you and employing it, you're going to explain to us. Yes. Well, um, I'm a lawyer since uh, 2010. I've been uh, a lawyer, a practicing lawyer in Lebanon, and I uh, joined and uh, was part actually of the founding initiative of an NGO called Legal Agenda. And uh, this NGO actually, uh, I mean, you can find actually what we, uh, uh, what we represent in the founding article that was written by a human rights lawyer, Nizar Sari, and the sociologist, a legal sociologist, uh, Samar Ghamroun. And the idea of the NGO was actually to reclaim the legal arena and sphere. Um, so to create an organization, actually, that uh, would make it possible to take back 
the law and uh, destroy all of the illusion of technicality that surrounds the law. Because we, we know, I mean, this, I think we can observe it in many countries. Uh, I have seen it in France, I see it in Lebanon, that there are lots of um, uh, language of technicality when we talk about the law. And this language of technicality and this atmosphere of technicality that you can see in the legal jargon, uh, what, what you were talking about, is actually there to serve certain uh, agendas and purposes. It is not something that is neutral. It is there actually to maintain the system, uh, to keep people quiet and to make it more and more hard to perceive that uh, the law, just like anything else in the society, uh, handles a uh, conflict of interests and, uh, uh, and there are many social and economic and political interests behind every aspect of the law, uh, whatever the technicality uh, may be. And so the idea with this uh, NGO uh, was actually to ha have a different approach of, of the law. Uh, to, and the main article was, uh, was entitled actually, uh, in order not to leave the law uh, for the legal professionals. Um, the idea behind it was actually that we need to recuperate the legal uh, sphere uh, and uh, to enter it again. Uh, uh, to actually uh, de deconstruct the power dynamic and interests that always underlie the legal system um, and, and actually to uh, uh, enter back uh, the legal scene with uh, uh, different uh, uh, social and economic perspectives uh, to enter actually the battle, uh, the legal battle. Uh, so this was the idea of this NGO, and uh, this is how I started working uh, with uh, on, on certain uh, uh, issues, uh, mainly LGBTQ issues, uh, handling um, cases where uh, trans individuals were being uh, uh, prosecuted based on an article in Lebanon. We are going to discuss this article um, and uh, and other issues just like. Uh, um, nationality issues, uh, invoking the Lebanese nationality for stateless individuals in Lebanon, refugees, and uh, defense rights in the course of uh, uh, arrests that have been done during uh, protests in 2015. I'm sorry, my connection cut out as soon as you started talking about your work um, in protection of the transfers in Lebanon. But I, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about these cases. Um, I, you've had a, a number of, and you've been involved with a number of really important landmark cases in Lebanon um, on these issues. Um, I would love for you to give a little bit of a background on these cases and also how movement lawyering made these landmark decisions um, uh, possible and how the community itself helped to form some of the strategies you use to get these landmark cases. Very good. So first of all, what we have in Lebanon is an article in the criminal code, which is article 534. And this uh, article um, criminalizes uh, intercourse against nature. It uh, states that intercourse against nature is uh, punishable up to one year of imprisonment. Uh, and so based on this article, uh, people get arrested uh, because of their sexual orientation and based on their gender identity, sexual orientation in case they have had intercourse or even were suspected of having intercourse with a person of the same biological sex and the same for trans individuals when uh, they have not uh, had recourse actually to uh, illegal um, uh, gender change. Uh, and uh, so what is interesting with the NGO that I was working with is that, and this is why we uh, also talk about um, this type of lawyering, is that for many, many, many years, uh, judges did not even have, uh, used to actually condemn people based on uh, uh, their uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, even if they there was no proof even of uh, any kind of, uh, 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 of sexual encounter. Uh, and, uh, and they never actually uh, found it necessary to justify in their court decisions why they would consider that uh, intercourse between individuals who have the same biological sex 
is an intercourse that is against nature. So it, it used to be something that they thought was uh, very um, uh, logical to say without even having to justify it. And so with the, uh, I mean, with uh, Nizar Sarie, who is the founding member of the NGO and executive director, we started actually, um, uh, we started going in front of the court to say that um, this type of reasoning is cannot be held. And that mainly that intercourse uh, between two individuals of the same biological sex is not against nature. And, um, and to, and we've had some kind of success in this since we have had more and more decisions and more and more landmark cases uh, with judges who have uh, uh, considered that our reasoning was correct. And um, But I'm going to stress more uh, maybe about the aspect of the movement lawyering. Uh, first of all, I started working on uh, trans cases uh, through an NGO uh, that is, um, I mean, that is a, uh, that has a community center uh, and that is in direct contact of many trans individuals. Uh, and this is why they came and saw me and asked me if I could start handling cases of trans individuals. And it was very important uh, in front of uh, uh, the court and mainly the appeal court because uh, we, have, we won the decision in front of the individual uh, judge, so it was the first uh, judge, who uh, based his reasoning on fundamental rights, so on human rights, and that it was not acceptable to consider that um, uh, intercourse uh, between uh, two individuals of the same biological sex is against nature. But when we, when the case was was appealed, because there was a lot of uh, uh, opposition uh, that came out of the uh, legal courtrooms, uh, uh, when it came out, and we were going to go and defend the case in front of the appeal court. It was very important in front of the appeal court to show that all of our reasoning was based on um, uh, values and ideas and uh, uh, that were local, that we were not talking about importing some kind of foreign uh, culture in Lebanon, that what we were talking about was something actually that is happening in Lebanon and that the ideas that we are talking about uh, were and the cultures that we were talking about were Lebanese cultures. Uh, and so this is where it was very important, the connection with the community, to show actually uh, that when we talk about uh, these types of relationships and any kind of relationships and any kind, kind of communities, uh, these were uh, Lebanese uh, uh, movements and not foreign movements. And this is how we constructed it, by showing actually to the judges uh, that when uh, we talk about LGBT movements and when we talk about individuals that have a different sexual orientation than the majority or a different gender identity, we were talking about Lebanese individuals who think Lebanese, who were brought up in Lebanon, and we showed actually to the court uh, with uh, actual data uh, that uh, what we are talking about was actually in the Lebanese society. And this actually, this kind of strategy was developed uh, by interacting uh, with the uh, Lebanese communities in order to show this. So we uh, brought up examples of this uh, and, um, and uh, we also started uh, connecting uh, other causes to it too. Uh, to show actually that when we talk about sexuality, uh, because it was very important also to show that today when we say intercourse against nature, it cannot be defined as an intercourse that does not have as an objective uh, to procreate. And this we have uh, shown by saying actually that now birth controls were allowed, I mean, we and the legislator allowed actually birth controls to be uh, sold in pharmacies, etc. and that we, uh, I mean, when we talk about the sexuality, even of individuals uh, that do not have the same biological sex, we cannot say today that uh, it has as an objective procreation. Uh, and so this, this is the kind of strategy that we constructed in front of the judges to show actually that uh, all of our strategy, all of our reasoning was based actually on the Lebanese community. Um, and this we have done uh, through other uh, medical NGOs. We have done uh, through the uh, uh, local NGOs that work directly with the communities. Um, in other cases, and 
this is why I think it's important also to talk about this. Um, when I, uh, in other cases, I have worked with trans individuals on this. Uh, we started actually um, constructing, uh, I mean, we started developing uh, and uh, exchanging uh, the legal and uh, uh, the legal uh, capabilities of the individuals involved in the trans community. Uh, so, for example, in one case, uh, I was defending one trans individual, and, the, and there was another trans individual that was arrested, and I wasn't the lawyer. Uh, but then, when uh, my my client was set free uh, by the judge, uh, it was. Uh, the other trans, the, it was the, the, my client actually that did all uh, that assisted me in all of the legal work in order to set the other person free. Um, third thing that was uh, very important in the landmark cases is that in this case, in these cases, it is very important uh, to see how uh, the individuals were arrested, and this we do not understand it uh, if we do not. Um, uh, if we do not understand actually and if we do not uh, discuss with the client what is happening and this is very important also uh, in order to develop the strategies in front of the court. Uh, in one of the cases actually we had um, a different trans individuals that were in a cafe uh, and these trans women uh, were arrested uh, because um, uh, agents, uh, police officers from the Moral Bureau came to this cafe and they just arrested all of the trans individuals that were there. Uh, they brought them to the precinct and it was in the course of the investigation that um, they started actually uh, interviewing them about what were uh, their, um, about actually who they were having sex with, who they are going out with, etc. And it was uh, based on these conversations that happened with the police officers that there were certain minutes that were uh, drafted. And based on the minutes, which included things that even my clients did not say, um, these individuals were brought up in front of the court. And um, during our conversations, a lot of my clients were asking me why were they being brought up in front of the court that they did not say anything and they did not even understand why they had been arrested. And um, it is by discussing all of this that we understood that what was happening here was a type of profiling and that the arrests were only based on uh, the appearance of the individuals. And it was actually transphobia that was being done here. And it was prosecuting just based on uh, a gender identity. And uh, regardless of the fact if the Article 534 applies or not to intercourse uh, between two individuals of the same biological sex. It was also important to uh, develop in our strategy in front of the court that the criminal code in Lebanon does not um, uh, criminalize identities uh, nor uh, orientation in itself. What the article talks about is intercourse. And in our opinion, it does not even apply to individuals uh, with the same biological sex. But like what I'm trying to say is that all of this interaction with the uh, communities help to develop the certain kind of strategies that can also bring victory in front of the courts. Because uh, in Lebanon, when we work around human rights or uh, in issues, social or economic uh, issues, we always have to defend ourselves against the, the argument of uh, foreign values that are here to impose themselves in Lebanon. And so it is very important to um, bring out the voice of local communities and to show actually that what we are talking about uh, in the way that we are talking uh, about it is something that is uh, very local. Thank you, uh, Mimna. It's really comprehensive and it's so fascinating to see the different strategies and the different involvement and um, support and engagement with the communities and why it led to these changes and landmark changes. One of the things that we discussed before together and I think is important to discuss here is this idea that um, international organizations or legal experts often try and parachute into um, different local contexts and communities without full understanding and how that could cause um, harmful impact because often that becomes really um, uh, 
a contradiction to a core concepts of any sort of movement lowering and it can create harm. Have you, what sort of advice would you have, for example, for students and for um, legal practitioners and so on, who may be working on an international level, who want to one, work with communities and two, want to work with um, communities that may be in somewhere like Lebanon and not their own locality? I think that um, you cannot parachute anything uh, in uh, any kind of society. So you cannot come uh, with a set of uh, uh, with, with, a, with a set of uh, uh, things that you would like to parachute and to to. I mean, you can come with a comparative approach if you'd like, but it is very important to engage uh, um, uh, within the local communities and the local lawyers and the local um, uh, sphere uh, to understand what is happening in the country and to develop even uh, strategies when you want to work on issues, especially issues that are related to economic, social, uh, political rights. Um, any kind actually of uh, 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 parachute approach uh, is uh, uh, like provokes uh, one provokes uh, uh, re uh, total rejection because um, uh, I mean you will see that uh, you are not talking on the same line um, uh, and to actually to actually be effective and to uh, to develop strategies that will lead you to victory uh, you need to develop these within uh, the individuals that are directly concerned with, with what we are talking about. Uh, so my advice would be to actually uh, go in within uh, the local communities to discuss, uh, to see the needs and the wants of the local communities and to develop strategies based on that. And um, uh, it is, I mean, this issue of uh, human rights, like when we talk about the universality of human rights or the le relativism of human rights, we are uh, at the center of it. When we talk about uh, certain issues in the societies, we are at the center of it. And any kind of approach that, we, we would, that would be here, like uh, trying to state that uh, uh, these are our uh, values, they are international values, and we are going to here, uh, we are coming to the local country to teach you about these values, is one totally rejected, and two will be faced by a very strong um, opposition, even in the legal circle, like uh, within the judges, within the lawyers, within um, uh, the local communities, there will be a rejection as if, what are they talking about? These are coming out of space. This is not our society. And then, and then you will be also faced with a very harsh uh, 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 opposition uh, from uh, uh, other parts of the society that are uh, uh, much, uh, I mean, that are against these types of uh, uh, these types of co causes, actually. Yes. Uh, and, and this actually, you see, it's not just. Not only, uh, not only when we talk about international experts coming into uh, a local country or coming into another country, you can see it also in the legal sphere. Like when yeah. we as lawyers in our practice try to parachute anything on our clients or on the communities that we are working with, it will not work. It will, be, uh, it will not uh, be understood. It will not be effective and it will be wrong. It will not uh, actually, um, uh, I mean, people will not recognize themselves with the type of discourse that you are having. Yes, 100%. And I, and I love that you um, also added in that parachuting can happen within our own context um, as technical experts and so on. I remember um, when we started um, constructing the work around um, the use of technology and queer dating apps and the targeting of individuals, we it became a very long process and we tried to ensure, of, of course, we always can be better and we need to always be better to ensure that we did initial one first, the, it was asked for that what we are doing was necessary and it was reported and, and it made sense. But even then we had to do some scoping and research with local groups in all the different places we were working, including Lebanon, to understand the strategies to take get information from the users who are affected by these arrests and targeting themselves and the local groups 
and it really informed the way we um, changed the different strategies we were going to use to hold companies accountable. So that, so um, when I'm talking about that, it had different layers to it, and it had this um, element to it where still today becomes very complicated to hold companies to account in a, a very productive way. But what became such an incredibly powerful tool was that we had this sort of expertise from different um, uh, stakeholders, from the legal experts, from the technologists, from um, the company representatives who brought in their technical expertise as a tool to support what the um, community, the local NGOs, the users had said they wanted to see changed and what the um, research was showing to fit into that dynamic rather than what was usually happening in terms of saying these are the issues we are the technical experts we are the lawyers that we know this, these laws or these uh, issues are problematic in this sense and we need to cr um, create this sort of change or the um, technologists who had uh, come in with issues around encryption or so on who was seeing different things as the problem area that needed to be changed and the local community when they started and we started engaging with um, those who were directly impacted all of these preconceptions were changed all of them were changed and it became better and stronger and we managed to have that sort of impactful change based on the needs and wants um, and we what I really want to also um, employ is that when we're working with tools such as the law, it becomes part of a tool case of um, effect and change. And it becomes part of a parcel of how we can affect change. You know, as um, legal experts, the way, for example, Legal Agenda has been using it, has been um, providing it as a um, part of a tool base is a broader movement to push for this change and not as a separate movement on its own and it becomes so powerful in that and um, so it's really it's really fascinating to hear all of that from you um, I know we have some time so whoever um, uh, has questions do write it down otherwise I would like us to continue because I do have more questions for you Yumna but uh, one of the things I wanted to also ask you to clarify whilst um, we see about questions is how do you deal with um, something that we hear come across often with uh, folks that want to employ movement lawyering is um, when some, let's say this concept that I talked about this, um, the language of strategy is different for your client and, and it may not be always in line for the movement itself. How do you navigate that as a lawyer yourself? Of course, what, uh, um, the first thing is that when uh, individuals like um, come to see me or to consult with me or want me to handle their cases, uh, I am part of a, a certain movement. So, uh, uh, so I lay down our strategies because like, we are going to take, for example, the Article 534. And, uh, and I say that actually we do not... Uh, uh, and so in these cases, like for example, uh, I explain our strategy, I explain what is our line of defense, which is to say that uh, the criminal code does not uh, criminalize any kind of identity or orientation, one. And two, uh, that we, uh, can, we go to say that uh, intercourse, against, uh, intercourse between individuals uh, who have the same biological sen uh, sex is not against nature. So this is our strategy. Some people, of course, will um, prefer uh, to uh, deny their sexual orientation or uh, even sometimes their gender identity. And this is something that, uh, uh, I mean, that I do not use as a strategy in uh, my kind, uh, in, in these cases. So what I usually say is that uh, for the person is, is that this is not the kind of strategy that I would use. I have the freedom to go see another type of lawyer, but that they can also, if that what they are talking about is the right uh, to have their privacy respected and not to uh, uh, go and uh, inform or be even interrogated in, by judges or police officers regarding their uh, gender identity or their 
sexual orientation, this is something that we can use in our strategy. So the thing is, is to take what the person is telling you to understand what is their fears and their anxieties and to understand how you can translate this in uh, uh, the lawyering that you are doing. Uh, for, for like the example that I have given, it is very important uh, for us also to state the right of privacy, to state the fact that the state or the police officers or the judges do not have the right to interfere in your um, sexual life, in anyone's sexual life. And this is uh, when I hear a client say that they would like to deny what uh, is being, uh, what they are being prosecuted for. Uh, for me, this is an expression of the need for them to have the right of privacy respected and this is how i uh, usually advise my clients to do so uh, and this is something else that we have talked about is um, the way i mean how we understand our role uh, because as i see myself actually is that we are at the uh, i mean we we as lawyers are here at the gates of the system. We are people that are put there at the gates of the system. And so our, uh, my job, my main job is not actually to, uh, or only or mainly to develop legal arguments or to go into that technicality. My main job actually is to um, uh, translate what the people have to say in the courts and to uh, actually bring out this bridge between the legal sphere and between the communities. Because I think that when we talk about uh, marginalized communities, the thing is, is that the system is so strong, the power dynamics are so strong in the system, is that uh, these communities are not seen in the legal sphere and they are not heard in the legal sphere. And when they go into, uh, like even physically, when they go into a courtroom and when they talk and when they speak, they will not be allowed to speak. And even when they do, um, the judges will not understand them and they will not understand the language of the judge. And so it is very important to, to voice, I mean, to translate this voice and to uh, allow for these communities to uh, voice out in front of the legal sphere. Um, and I think that when this is done, you have half of the, half of the victories, uh, half of the victory that is uh, gained uh, by this way of voicing, of uh, getting the voice out there. And this, I have seen it with LGBT communities. I have seen it with cases of domestic violence. Uh, when you are there and when you put out the domestic violence and when you uh, show it and when you uh, voice out and when you defend your right to be heard and when you um, uh, destroy the technicality, the language technicality, the, the physical technicality, because there are also a lot of uh, uh, physical uh, customs that you have in the courtrooms, etc., etc. And when you do that, half of the battle is actually uh, gained. This is, uh, this is what I think. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question there. I, I, I'll defer to Mason right now. Yes, I just wanted to read it out so that we, we have it on the recording here. So this question is from Raquel and says, do you have any ideas about how we can make movement lawyering more sustainable, avoiding depending on donor, uh, donor funding and philanthropy so we don't perpetuate those same structures of power we are trying to dismantle? So if either of you have thoughts on that. So it's an excellent question and I think a very tough one. Uh, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes. Uh, so in in my kind of work my work is very diverse uh, so um, i have uh, corporate law i practice corporate law i practice uh, uh, other kinds of uh, of law uh, that makes it possible for me uh, to have other sources of funding which makes it possible also to sustain these kinds of initiatives so i do not uh, depend actually on funding that gets from uh, other organizations, etc. And this is how I can actually develop the practice of pro bono while being able to uh, to survive. And I think that now what we are seeing uh, in Lebanon, for example, we are seeing some kind of groups that are uh, developing, uh, that are grassroots groups and that are developing other models, other uh, economical models, etc., etc., based on uh, certain kinds like cooperatives, but cooperatives in 
a lot of spaces, like in uh, not just in uh, economical sectors like uh, agriculture and industrial, but other kinds also of cooperatives. And I think that these kind of initiatives that help actually uh, bring bring in uh, many kinds of um, I mean uh, many kinds of uh, uh, tools. Uh, are, are very helpful. Um, so these, these kinds of solidarity uh, are very, uh, makes it possible actually to liberate yourself from the funding. Of course, it will never be an entire, uh, I mean, you will always have, I mean, some kind of funding, but it will not be the, the core of your uh, activity. In other cases, like for example, in my various activities, when I defend uh, individuals in cases of like uh, based on 534 or et cetera, et cetera. And I don't, uh, I don't uh, usually take uh, fees for these kinds of lawsuits. These individuals are also individuals that are productive in the society, that uh, create jobs, that have companies, et cetera, et cetera. And they will come see me for other types of activities, which uh, will be funded privately because if they need to set up a company, if they need legal advice, et cetera. So this is what I can say actually about this question. Yeah, thank you, Yumna. I would just only add to that that even when it comes to funding, um, I I do. So a, a lot of like the movements that we're part of, a lot of like the NGOs and the projects that come about, do rely on this funding. And I always ask that people push back on the sort of narratives funders do place on what's important, what sort of activities they want to see, and so on. That may pretty much feed into these structures we're talking about. So if you are getting funding as well to these, do this sort of um, different elements of movement lawyering, it's important that even in the funding structure and the funding you're getting and the sort of um, activities and outputs you're looking to provide for, that you're push, trying to at least push back with the funder to not perpetuate the same sort of systems of power that harm these communities. And um, I've had many occasions of uh, debating with funders of what is necessary and needed to be focused on and how, um, for example, I will need to change certain elements of the project to ensure that it's reflective of what the community wants and needs. Um, it's it's a difficult one, especially in because um, I, I want us not to constantly rely on um, volunteerism of different um, people putting in their expertise and work into this um, element, especially people like Yumna, who's working in a very complex environment and doing um, complex work, but also to put pressure on those who are providing funding to fund what is necessary and needed and required rather than what is um, seen by them as the sort of aspect that requires funding. But um, I think in the broad view of things, hopefully we will never need to rely on funders again. <laughs> and we can move away from that structure soon. Um, this has been a really great conversation and I hope we can um, continue. I, I know that we have another conversation um, tomorrow uh, with Kendra that's, um, and Danielle Blond about the work that they've been doing around the legal provisions and laws that harm sex workers um, globally, especially in the US. Um, but I, I wanted to re-emphasize some of the things that you've been saying um, uh, uh, and ask you whether there is more that can be done from um, your colleagues that are, let's say, out here in the States, elsewhere, to support the work you and Legal Agenda have been doing to support the work of the communities. I know I am involved in different ways myself with some of them, but in general, um, for you to outline a little bit of that too. Yeah, I don't know, we have to uh, think about that, of course, but um, I don't know, a lot to be done, actually. I. Uh, uh, but we will have to develop this. We'll have to think about it much. Uh, yeah, um, I know yeah. one thing. One thing you mentioned and is having access to the like, clinics and so on that are here, and kind of further collaboration between um, the uh, 
low faculties and clinics you're working with and those that are here that to kind of push some of this and kind of this, this sort of knowledge exchange so I think that would be really great to look at um but I'm just really really happy and I'm hoping that we can as a collective continue to push for more movement lawyering and to push our colleagues to employ it more as well um, but thank you for everyone that came and thank you so much, Yumna, for taking the time. I know it's a difficult time in um, Lebanon right now and we didn't even get to discuss the complexities <laughs> that come with that. Yeah. But I am so grateful for everything you do. Hopefully speak to you very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, Asana, um, for leading that excellent conversation. I just also want to say thank you to uh, our sponsors for this event, the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and the Office of Clinical and Pro Bono Programs at the Harvard Law School uh, for their support in getting this set up. And um, yes, hope to see as many of you as possible tomorrow at 1 p.m. for the second part in our two-day series on movement lawyering. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.